Hi everyone, this is The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was an author who is famous for his dark, macabre stories like The Telltale Heart, which involves a rather paranoid murderer, uh, his very spooky, sad poem, The Raven. He was also credited with being the creator of the modern detective story. This story, however, uh, let me explain a little bit about the title. Uh, first of all, a cask is simply, it's a barrel of wine. Amontillado is a type of wine. Now, this story isn't really about wine, but you need to know what that is for us to go a little bit further. This story also takes place during the carnival season in Italy, uh, where many people are dressed up and wearing costumes and all that. This is important for the setting. So anyway, let me go ahead and get started with actually reading it. I'll explain a few things as we go along. It's a little, I use a lot of big words and uh, it might be a little bit hard to get into in the first few paragraphs, but once it gets rolling, it's some really good stuff. And this is one of my favorite short stories. Uh, so, The Cask of Amontillado. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. All right, if you found yourself a little lost there, let me just kind of explain. Uh, there's really only two characters you need to keep track of in this story. One of them is Fortunato, and the other is our narrator. And his name is Montresor. That hasn't been revealed yet, but I'm not really giving anything away by telling you that our narrator's name is Montresor. And basically just starts off with him essentially just saying that, you know, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. Basically, I put up with as much of Fortunato's crap as I possibly could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. When he insulted me, I said, okay, I'm going to get this guy back. And you, who so well know the nature of my soul, to realize like this whole story, it's like a, uh, it's almost like a confession. Uh, Montresor is telling this story to somebody who apparently knows him rather well. Uh, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. So when Fortunato insulted me, I, you know, I vowed I was going to get revenge, but I didn't threaten him. I didn't, I didn't say anything out loud. At length, I would be re avenged. This was a point definitively settled. So, oh yeah, I was going to get him. I was going to get my revenge. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. You know, if you're going to get revenge on someone, th there might be some risk on your part. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. So basically, if you want to get somebody back, when you want to get revenge, if you get so caught up with it that it consumes you to the point where you, you, know, you make mistakes, then you're never going to fully get the revenge that you seek. And it's equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. Basically, I need to get him back. And it needs to be abundantly clear to him that I am getting him back, that I'm getting revenge. So this isn't going to be some kind of a sneaky sort of thing where, you know, he's going to push him into traffic or push him off a cliff when he's not looking. He's got to get him in a way where he, where Fortunato knows that, you know, that, that, that he's getting him and who's doing it to him when he finally gets him back. What that entails, well, that's what the story is all about. Anyway, I won't need to explain every single paragraph as thoroughly as I did this one. Like I said, once it gets going, it rolls pretty nicely. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face. And he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. So... Kept being totally cool around Fortunato. When I saw him, I would smile. But the only thing he didn't realize is, now when I'm smiling, the thing that I'm thinking about is, I'm going to destroy you. That's what immolation means. So it was the thought of his immolation, the thought of his destruction.
It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. Immolation means destruction. So basically, our narrator continued to smile, act nice and friendly to Fortunato, but little did Fortunato realize that the reason why our narrator is smiling is because he's thinking about how he's going to destroy Fortunato. So yeah, I'm smiling, but little you know, it's because I'm thinking, I'm going to kill you. Anyway. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. So there's one thing that Fortunato, he, that he, did, he does know a lot about wine. And our narrator says that that's a weakness, that Fortunato knows a lot about wine. Not so much that he knows a lot, but he's particularly proud of his knowledge of wine. How that turns into a weakness, well, we're going to find out when we keep reading the story. It was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He, he accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. So, Fortunato, again, he's, remember, uh, it's the carnival season, so he's all dressed up, uh, as you see uh, there in this picture. Uh, you know, a, kind of a silly outfit, a fool's outfit, you know, a clown, perhaps a better word for that there. Uh, and, you know, you got to love it because, our, again, our narrator sees him and just shakes his hand and is just so excited. And, again, we know why our narrator is excited. Uh, Fortunato just thinks that uh, our narrator is happy to see him. And uh, keep in mind, very important plot detail. Fortunato is drunk when, we, when he first meets him here, okay? So he's starting off dressed all funny like this, like a clown, and he's drunk. This is important. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montiato, and I have my doubts. Wow, said he. A Montiato? A pipe? Impossible. In the middle of the carnival? I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado! I have my doubts. Amontillado! I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchesi. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a rocular closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. So a few things here, everybody. So there's Montresor wearing his uh, mask. Uh, and he's got his, he's a drawing a rocular closely about a person. Basically, you know, it's, it's, it's his robes, you know, kind of co covers uh, himself up. Uh, 
Well, again, it's it's the carnival season. Uh, normally, uh, it would be weird for a guy to be wearing a mask out in the public streets, but not during the carnival season. This is all part of his plan, because if, For if Fortunato disappears and people go ask around, it's like, hey, anybody see Fortunato? It's like, yeah, well, we saw him with Montresor. Uh, no, they see they're only going to see him walking around with somebody who has a mask on. So. You know, and that could be anybody. And it's not so strange for somebody to have a mask because it's the carnival season. 